because that's where they like to mm. put the dead guys that they killed. Um, I think in the next the next shot, old cars, motors, transmissions, ice boxes, wagon wheels, you name it. Okay. Um, the EPA has given 234 permits to clean this up and they've taken out 11 feet of what they describe as black mayonnaise, okay? The metal that was in there, they're actually meant melting down and using it again, but apparently after all the water is taken out of there, uh, the remainder is a very good base for cement and concrete. So that's what's going on. They're trying to gentrify the area again. Um, now the origins of, of um, of Gowanus, uh, there was the Canarsie Indians lived there when uh, people came from Europe. Then finally the Dutch arrived, Peter Stuyvesant, uh, you know, all of you know knew. Uh, the area was called Brukenen, which means broken land. And if you know geology, Long Island is basically a giant terminal moraine of the Pleistocene epoch. All of Long Island, which includes Brooklyn and Queens, was pushed down from Canada and deposited right there. So that's how we got the name of Brooklyn, okay, from that. Uh, also, in extreme high and low tides that go in and out of New York Harbor, they would push the grist mill going in and going out to grind the, 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 the flour. Okay, so that's a picture of that. I'm trying to get you grounded in the area before we start. And somebody had mentioned about uh, the, the uh, George Washington's troops being there. Okay, this is the, the, the Vecti Cortellium house. Today it's uh, called the Stone Fort. You can actually go and visit it. Uh, it was built around 1699 by a guy named Claes Vecti. And his son Nicholas was living there when the Revolutionary War happened. And in particular, George Washington kept some of his troops, 400 guys from Maryland, in there. And they pretty much defended him until at least two thirds of them were killed and Washington got to escape in the fog over to Manhattan and up to Tarrytown. If that didn't happen, we'd all have the, the, the Queen of England as uh, our leader today because he got a way to fight again. So this is a very important uh, place. So of course, when the Dodgers did their, they were called Dodgers then, when they did their team, they named it Washington Park after the Battle of Brooklyn Heights that was fought there. And this is, this is the Vecti uh, 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 Cortelio house today and how it looks. It actually was resurrected in 1933 because it had basically gone right down the ground level and they had to reconstruct it using original pictures, but they also used the original materials that were part of the original house. And you can go there today. Yeah. All right, here's some pictures I took of where Washington Park is today. Uh, on the picture on the right, you can see behind the, uh, in the background, the, the uh, Vecti Cortelio house. And right where the playground is would have been where the playing field was that the original team played. Um, move on to the next. Now, many people didn't realize that baseball was played in Brooklyn on ice before even the Red Stockings, okay? So we're going back to the first recorded game on, on ice took place February 4th, 1861, between the Atlantics and the Charter Oaks. It was witnessed by 12,000 people, and the Brooklyn Eagle reported of the wonderful tone of the game and that only a few players slipped, but those that did provided a source of infinite, infinite merriment <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to those that were watching. Now, the game was set up like this. You had four bases, okay? Uh, but you could always skate every base, because if you're on skates, there's no way you're going to stop on second base, right? Or third. So you could, you could always skate every one of them. Uh, there was a red ball, there was ten players, and the game lasted five innings. Uh, the picture on the right is actually uh, when Washington Park was open. This picture is from the Harper's Magazine in 1884. In 1883, they actually opened the field for the team to play. They were called the Brooklyns. They were never called the Atlantics. They were never called the Grays. Anything that you've seen that had those names is incorrect. Okay, I did a thorough newspaper search, and the first real name we have is the Bridegrooms when some of them got married in, in uh, 1888, 1887, that era. 
Okay, next shot. Uh, now, how did the Dodgers start? Well, in 1882, there was a 30-year-old newspaper man named George Taylor, who was uh, a graduate of St. Xavier College, and he went to see uh, an attorney named Bryce on Broadway because some angel, and, and in all the documents it says an angel backed out, and he wanted to, he had the land, but he had no backers. Okay, that's the story that's been sent to us over the years, uh, but as I'm gonna explain to you, maybe all these stories are wrong and explain to you why. Okay, I've noted over time that people have quoted different sources as to how the team started. Every one of them is different, and it's that the people that were asked knew the answer, but over 30 or 40 years, they, they weren't allowed to tell the answer, so they kind of remembered the version they were told to tell everyone, but that version changed over time. Okay, now what we have here is, uh, that's the New York Herald, and on the left is Macy's. This is where they hold the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade every year, okay? And on, just out of the picture to the right would be Gimbel's, and if you'll remember from Miracle on 34th Street, Macy's sent, if he didn't have something, he sent it to Gimbel's. So Gimbel started sending them back to Macy's. Okay, so this is where the idea for the Dodger team happened. Also, too, let's remember, in 1882, something very important was happening, the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. And now we have a baseball team in Brooklyn in 1883. They knew it was going to grow. So they were speculating. Now, from all sources, we find that this um, George J. Taylor went and found an attorney named Bryce. And I went actually looked through the directories of that time. Back then, if you look through directories, you don't take a phone book. But obviously, they didn't have phones. So all they would put was your name and your profession. So I looked in the Manhattan uh, directory and not only found out where Bryce's office was, I found out uh, where he lived, which is right to the uh, entrance to the uh, Lincoln Tunnel. Okay, if you know New York at all. Now, the picture on the right, if you see the building on the left in the black and white picture, that's where his law offices uh, were. Okay, there must have been a fire or something all the time, because if you see in the picture of the right, it's now a McDonald's. So the legal papers that started the Dodgers, if you ever go to New York and go to the corner of Broadway and Thomas, you can have a happy meal right where they went and signed the papers that started the Dodgers. Okay, our main character here, and this reminds, do you remember the, the, the Wizard of Oz where the old man was behind the curtain and Toto pulled back the curtain and the old man says, ignore that man behind the curtain, because he just wanted to see uh, the, the, the figure that was fierce, right? Well, this is what was going on with the Dodgers. This, this is the guy who was the figurehead. The other guys, I mean, they had some not nice stuff going on, so we don't hear too much about them for about a decade. Now, now Charlie Byrne, I've got some information on him right here. Very well-liked guy, he was very short, he's about five foot two. They called him the, the little uh, Napoleon, and he's claimed to have a sarcastic wit, bright, talkative, articulate, believed in honor and fair play in the American way, and the press described him as a snazzy dresser. They said that Charlie Byrne would be immaculate if there was frost in Hades, okay? Uh, one, that's what one sports uh, writer observed, and as I mentioned, they called him Napoleon in baseball. Uh, Byrne loved the theater more than he liked baseball, like Bo La Boheme was one of the things that he liked. And, and he comes to us from history as promoting Ladies' Day to encourage better behavior at ballparks, because they were all rowdy guys. He established baseball's first non-smoking section in Brooklyn's Washington Park. He introduced the concept of a rain check, because if people expected rain, they wouldn't go to the ballpark. <laughs> This way you get them hooked. Uh, if they can't see the game today, they can see another game. The coaches boxes that you see at baseball uh, game, uh, games today were, were also created uh, by uh, Mr. Charles Byrne. Uh, he did real estate and he rented a, uh, uh, a desk in Bryce's law firm. And this is where uh, Taylor came and, and spoke to Bryce. What do I do? This guy backed out of doing a park with me. 
Well, Byrne heard the story and he went and found the money. Okay? Uh, also, uh, Charles Byrne was known to, uh, along with Albert Spaulding, help kill the Players League, which threatened the National League existence in 1890. And he was a, a leader amongst the National League magnates. He died of Bright's disease at age 55 in 1898. That's a failure of the kidneys, I assume. A lot of these guys, their diets weren't too good back then. A lot of fat, a lot of wine, and not enough water. Okay, he died of that. Uh, he's buried in Calvary Cemetery near the Kosciuszko Bridge with a view of Manhattan. And I, I make references to movies because I'm also a movie aficionado. But if you saw The Midnight Cowboy where Dustin Hoffman went to the cemetery to visit his uh, father, who was a, a, a polished shoes, that's Calvary Cemetery. In The Godfather, when the, the big Don was killed and they held the cemetery, that also was uh, um, Calvary Cemetery. And the main figures of the gangs of New York, the, 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 the movie, if you saw that with Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, those two guys were buried also in Calvary Cemetery. Next slide. Here's where we start getting hairy with the owners of the Dodgers. Uh, Joe Doyle owned a gambling casino at 12 Ann, Ann Street. Ann Street's one of the oldest cities in New York City, and it's right off the Brooklyn Bridge. So when the Brooklyn Bridge opened and you came to New York City, you were kind of left at the doorstep of his place. Uh, also, if you look on the right, you see Barnum's uh, Museum, P.T. Barnum. Okay, that was on Ann Street and Broadway. And uh, right across the street on Ann Street was Doyle's place. Now I'm kind of reminded of, uh, what was it that Barnum said, there's a sucker born every minute? Well, Joe Doyle quoted what would be W.C. Fields, never give a sucker an even break or smarten up a chump. Okay, these guys were in, in, in it, one thing only, and that was to make money. Okay, and you know, gambling is kind of considered uh, a, a business in a way, but you don't have to put much labor in it. Okay, and it was a toy of the wealthy, and we'll see that as we go along here. Okay. okay now, now we're going to talk about Ferdinand de Bell. This guy was slippery. You could never find this guy. He didn't want you to find him, okay? When you look at, and we'll, we'll go over this in a minute with proof from the newspapers, uh, there's laws against gambling in Rhode Island, and there's also laws against gambling in New York City, and also at the racetracks in Saratoga, and you weren't allowed to have gambling holes, okay? He's associated with all of that. Uh, here we have at Narragansett Pier a uh, picture from the uh, around 1890 and a current day picture. Uh, on the right in the middle in the black and white picture is where his gambling casino was there. Uh, it was listed on, and they didn't know this too, I spoke to them at the Narragansett Historical Association. On the layout of the place there was a, a special area called a society club. Okay, AKA gambling joint. Okay. But here's, here's the big one he had. Okay, I showed you the Herald before that was uh, um, owned and run by James Gornett, Gordon Bennett. Bennett actually built the casino, which is the Tennis Hall of Fame today, and where lawn tennis started in 1880. He actually built it there. And uh, at the same time, a bell built a gambling casino, which I just found the picture of yesterday. And that's it. Um, in all the historical records that I read, they talked about this maze that went from the casino where all the wealthy people came and had the, the, the regattas and the boats and stuff. Uh, they didn't even know about this place. You had to go through a giant maze just to find the door of this place. On the right, do you see the little door in the back? That's where people entered his gambling casino. It was known as the clubhouse, also it was known as the, the Nautilus Club. And he made millions and millions of dollars. The money that started the team that would, would uh, become the Dodgers all came from gambling. All right, now this is actually from the certificate of association down here that I have in front of you. Here's a list of the owners. And nobody really knew anything about that. Whenever you wanted to look up anything about any of these guys, it's only when something legal happened that you get their names. 
So when you file a certificate of association to start a corporation, the names of the people have to be listed. And very prominently on the right, the day after, you can see the papers were signed, we now have an announcement made. Usually these things were buried in readers' ears next to broken glass and baby carriages so no one could find them because they didn't want to be found. Okay. It's not moving. <laughs> Where's my buddy? Space bar is not moving again. Well, I'll continue talking while he does, while he fixes that up. Okay, now as far as uh, uh, Abel, we know that he was born in Providence, Rhode Island. His uncle, Aruna S. Abel, founded the Baltimore Sun, and it was run by his cousin, George, in, in, in uh, uh, Ferdinand's lifetime. We never see him for about a decade. He co-owned the 1818 Broadway Club, which was a casino. They finally sold out in 1890. And oh, isn't it a coincidence? Right after he sold the gambling club that was in uh, uh, New York City, now all of a sudden we see his name. Okay? Prior to that, knowing his name could have actually caused you to, uh, uh, caused him to be arrested. Okay? He was also associated with uh, two fellows named Luce Appleby and Davy Johnson. Those, they were bookies, they were bookkeepers. And they took book on everything from baseball games and uh, race tracks. And I'd like to just speculate for a minute, if I can. If you remember Taylor, the guy who had the idea for the team, he was with the New York Herald, and Bennett, who built the casino on Rhode Island, also. They, did, they, they actually did not allow the news about these guys to come out. I actually found it, but I had to find it in Cincinnati and St. Louis because any, it, was, it was filtered out, their names totally. Um, I, in my historical data, I've read that there were pitchers and umpires that threw games. And also, too, uh, the casino sent people around during the games with business cards to their two clubs, Doyle, uh, 12 Ann Street and uh, 818 Broadway. Uh, and if they found someone who liked gambling, they told them, come on down. And they would come to these clubs and they got the finest dinners in New York, free, because they knew if they had a gamble hooked, he's going to pay for that dinner many times over. All right, so here's how it's broken up, the ownership. And you can see that the two top guys own 90% of the team, right? Now, the only names they ever gave were the two middle guys that own 5% each. So for a decade, whenever you talked about the Brooklyn team, you were only shown the names of, of Byrne and Taylor, okay? Never the other two guys. Okay, now if we, we take a look here, I found this from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on July 17th, 1886. Um, to the editor, to assist in the exposure of the management of the Brooklyn Baseball Club, I enclose you some statements which are facts the public should be acquainted with, particularly the Brooklyn public. Manager Byrne is simply the manager for his brother-in-law and his brother-in-law's partners, who are the proprietors of two well-known gambling houses in New York, known as 818 Broadway and 12 Ann Street. They are prominent bookmakers as well, Joe Doyle is the brother-in-law of Byrne, and the money man is F.A. Abel, also known as Gus Abel. They spelt his name different and wrong many times. Abel wouldn't have an L. They call him Gus. They call him F.A. They call him F.G. They call him F. Uh, so whenever you look, you would know if you're doing historical research, you have to look for all these spellings because they were hiding everything that they were doing because they didn't want anyone to know. Okay, also too, there were uh, uh, associates of a loose Appleby, of Appleby and Johnson, uh, the bookmakers and partners in 818 Broadway. All right, so let's move on. Now, now just to show you what was given to the public for 10 years. Okay. Here we go in the legal section, hidden back, 
with all of the uh, broken glass and baby carriage sales. Now we have these guys' names. And if you were interested in sports or baseball, would you look there? I mean, unless you went in a baby carriage or broken glass or whatever it was, you wouldn't look there. But here we prominently have their names. And that's the only place you're going to find them in that era. Okay, now, here are three other uh, uh, references, because, you know, if you're going to do research, you want backup proof, right? So, what do we find? Who are they? This is from the New York Commercial Advertiser, number 818 Broadway. At number 818 Broadway, the whole house is devoted to gambling. It's fitted up luxuriously, and a very large game is carried on. A faro game is dealt, it was like a precursor of poker, and it came from France and it was played in the Wild West a lot. The firm serves an elaborate luncheon and supper every day to their customers. The proprietors are Gus Abel and company, and they are apparently raking in a rich harvest. And then we go to number 12 Ann Street. Number 12 Ann Street, Joe Doyle proprietor, is another notorious gambling house. The first and second floors are devoted to games of roulette and faro. The commercial advertiser report has visited the place, but were refused admittance by a man who looked through a slide in the door. A game was in progress at the time, as the clicking of players' chips could be heard in the background. The police actually came and tried to break in there one night. The door must have been built like Fort Knox. They couldn't get in the place for hours. So they decided to break into the place next door, figuring it was connected. It wasn't, and the people that owned that place sued the police and won. <laughs> okay? So, from what I've read, supposedly 20% of the profits were paid to the police and politicians so they, would ignore, so they would ignore them. But of course, how would you know what their profits were? they just tell you that's their profits and that's that, right? Okay? Then the middle one talks about the Central Club at 18th Broadway, 8, 818 Broadway was frequented by the wealthiest and nervy, nerviest gamblers of the time. Fabulous sums are said to have been won and lost here. The police never interfered with it for 30 years or more. Apparently, these clubs started right after the Civil War in New York, and they were around at the time of these guys. And uh, the, the, the last section there, I'm, I'm not going to read it to you, but this is when they actually went and closed on July 12, 1890. This is when the uh, uh, 818 Club was closed. And then right, right after that, we start seeing Gus Bell's name associated with the baseball team. Now, this is the timeline as I know it, and I think is correct. There, there was an indefinite time when George Taylor went around Brooklyn looking for land and found it. Supposedly an angel from Wall Street uh, backed him, and there's many references to this angel, yet we don't know if it was Gabriel or whoever the angel was. He's never ever mentioned. <coughs> he then went and found a lawyer to go after this guy, and Byrne rented a desk from the lawyer Byrne walked seven blocks to 12 Doyle Street to find his brother, Joe Doyle, who founded Ferdinand de Bell, and they all got together and started the team. And according to the papers, the legal papers that started the, the Dodger team, uh, what we know is all this happened in two months, okay? Around January 2nd or so, he went to Bryce's office, and by March 8th, they're moving the dirt, and on March 9th, the papers are signed. Now, here's what you get if you look historically, because I've read everyone's papers on this and they referred you back, and here's all the cover stories. Okay, we've got the facts right here. Okay, January 18, 1913, Doyle spent $12,000 preparing the land. If you look on the uh, certificate of uh, uh, association, it says that they started with $5,000 of, of, of money, and it wasn't laid out by Doyle, it was laid out, laid out by the corporation, of which Bell laid out most of the money. Uh, also, it, it, the sources say that it took Doyle a long time to convince Bell to join. Well, if this was all done in two months, where's the long time? Okay. 
When Abel joined the firm, its name was changed to Byrne, Doyle, and Company. No, it wasn't. It was always a corporation right from the start. Bryce drew up co-partnership papers with Taylor, Byrne, and Doyle. New York Clipper, March 4, 1899. No, all we had is 60 days and a corporation. Work for grading began at once, and Doyle laid out the money. No, it says March 5th, the money was laid out right in the certificate of association. The same Clipper article claims that Evitz was the first secretary. No, he wasn't. He wasn't around for 10 more years. George Taylor was the secretary. In a book called Dodger Days and Nights by Tommy Holmes that was uh, written in 1953, he claimed that Byrne and Doyle were partners in the gambling uh, hall at 12 Ann Street. No, Byrne was never part of it. It was always Doyle and Abel. Uh, all sources agree that Byrne did real estate and rented a desk at Bryce's offices at 317 Broadway. But all the sources agree that it was uh, Taylor that came with the land already signed for it. Okay, so apparently Byrne didn't use his real estate for any of that. Frank Graham in the Brooklyn Dodgers on page four in 1945 states that Taylor went to his friend with a deal, no angels, no intermediaries, no corporations, just co partnerships, sub-corporations. He also claimed that an R.I. Byrne was the last to join. Nowhere other than in this book do I find anyone named R.I. Byrne. Okay, on the cover of the Sporting Life on January 7, 1899, it claims that Abel did not join the others until they were in the American Association in 1884. No, in 1883 they already were there. They didn't want their names known. Okay, in Byrne's obituary in the Sporting Life of the New York Times, in both of them it read that Abel did not join the group until they were in the American Association, and in the Sporting Life they said that it wasn't until he was in the American, they were in the American Association. The certificate of, of uh, association that I bring to you tonight disproves all this. Also, they, one of the cover stories was that the Bell owned a lot of property in New York. No. I looked in the directory back then. He had a mansion at 22 East 43rd Street between Madison and Fifth, and that was it. Everything else was gambling. Okay, other sources uh, claim that he had uh, land on Fifth Avenue. No, he had no land on Fifth Avenue. Uh, and where he actually had his house, was right near what became Grand Central Station. And in 1871, you could hop on the train to go to Hartford and uh, uh, New Haven and up to, to Narragansett and Newport, where his gambling clubs were. Okay, so that, that is where all that comes from. And that's what the true man is on that can be proved by this. Okay, on the certificate of association, they actually drew out the plan for the park. Okay, you can see it on the left. And on the right, the Sanborn maps of New York City and of Brooklyn shows what it looked like three years later. And you can see the curved section of uh, the grandstand being added. And also, too, you can see a second grandstand on the left of the picture. Here's a, a picture of uh, Washington Park One. Okay, it gives the dates that they played there from 83 to 91. There's a second picture below it, so you have an idea what it looks like from the inside. Um, now from the outside, oh no. The, these are actually from my base floor. I, I, I mentioned earlier, some of you came in late. I have a quarter of a million Dodger artifacts back to 1883 that I started collecting when I was five years old. Uh, and I lived right off of, uh, Bedford Avenue near where the Brooklyn Dodgers played. So they've been in my blood for a long time. These are original baseball cards, the old judge baseball cards from 1887, and they're actually taking the pictures at Washington Park One. I'd like to point out a couple of things to you. Does it look like they took care of the grass very well? Okay, I don't know what a lawnmower was back then. Also, if you look uh, at the bleachers, um, my high school had better bleachers than that. And the funniest thing is, look at the guy with the glove. That looks like a glove that you buy at the 99 cent store to pick up garbage. And that's what they were playing baseball with in 1887. Okay, so here again we've got uh, Washington Park in uh, uh, 
in today's world what it looks like. I took those pictures back in my hometown. These are the Brooklyn Bridegrooms. They won the uh, uh, championship in 1888, 1889 rather, in the American Association, and then in 1890 won it again when they entered the National League. Now, what's really funny is you think that if a manager just won two championships, you really like him, right? He was let go the next year. The guy in the middle, Bill McGonagall, Gunner McGonagall, okay, they let him go because they were now forced to accept a bad land deal. Okay, which I'll get into next. Next slide. Oh, all right. This is a picture at the National League uh, meetings. The, the little guy on the bottom right is uh, um, Charles Byrne. He supposedly was only five foot two, and he died uh, about six months after this uh, woodcut was was uh, drawn. Also to the left in the middle, you'll see Ferdinand de Bell. He was at the meeting of the National League in 1897. And right above him, you'll see uh, Ned Hanlon and uh, Harry Bonderhorst, who owned the uh, Baltimore Orioles. Uh, supposedly some backdoor deal was made where he would uh, bring the Orioles and their best players up to Brooklyn to play there. And now 51% of the team was owned by the guys who formerly were in, uh, in Baltimore. Okay, also the, uh, the other smallish man in the middle is Nick Young. He ran the National League back then. So now we've got these guys that we're stuck with. Uh, do you remember the uh, movie The Right Stuff? Okay, well, these guys on the left were the wrong stuff. Okay, the only interest they had in baseball was, we want to put a park here so that uh, the property that we own goes up in value. Okay, uh, one of them uh, on the top, Wendell Goodman, he, he ran the, uh, the uh, the L elevated railroad, so they could put in more trains, more people, okay? The guy in the bottom, Ralph Linton, who universally, they say that uh, he was the most disliked person in Brooklyn, and on a daily basis, he offended somebody, okay? Uh, so Bell, Doyle, and Byrne were forced to accept the merger that they didn't want with this uh, 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 players league that just started up, and, um, Here's what Charles Byrne said about it in the Brooklyn Eagle, that he did not purpose to desert so good and popular a ground as Washington Park for the furtherance of other people's real estate schemes, according to the Brooklyn Eagle. But for 30 grand, he turned his back. Oh, and incidentally, they never paid all the 30 grand. Okay. Um, if you recall that picture of the, uh, of the National League uh, meeting, uh, Abel was quoted saying at that time that uh, uh, that he wouldn't enter the chambers with any of these guys unless his money and wallet were checked at the desk at the lobby of the hotel. Okay, I, I think he probably would know about that, right? Because he could be trusted well either. All right, now I don't know what to say about John Montgomery Ward. I mean, I could do a, a presentation on just on this guy. This was an amazing person. He was a Renaissance man. Um, he pitched the second perfect game in history. Uh, he pitched a, a one nothing 18 inning game. Uh, what kind of a rubber arm could you have to pitch 18 innings and win one nothing? And after his pitching career was over, he went and played the infield and got 2,100 points, 2,100 uh, hits rather. He also played in the PGA, okay, as a golf player. So you know, you, you gotta wonder with somebody like that, and he was a lawyer at the same time. So now you got a baseball player, a golf player, uh, a pitcher, a fielder, a batter, and all in one guy. And he portended what would happen 100 years later because he wanted the players to get a piece of the action. Okay, so he was really way ahead of his time. Okay, so now we're going to Easton Park, that second park. This was in East New York. Um, the uh, programs that you see there are from my Dodger collection, okay, at Easton Park. Uh, there's only one picture of Easton Park. All you're going to see here is, you know, like the woodcut on the bottom, uh, the drawing of how the field was laid out. 
and a map of what it looked at the time. Here's the only picture, historically, that we know of of East Fifth Park. Now, the only thing that ever uh, happened there was, uh, and this is quoted wrong all the time, they kept saying the trolley dodgers were in the 1880s. Well, you know, I'm sorry. In the 1880s, they had in Brooklyn trolleys that were driven by horses at four or five miles an hour. I don't think they would be too hard to dodge. Okay, and uh, right here in front of me, I've got an article from the Brooklyn Eagle dated April 20th, 1890, on page 20, that Brooklyn opened their first electric car line, okay? Now, I think you need a lot more than just one to dodge them, so it's gonna be a few years later, right? Um, and actually, that trolley on there is the first trolley that there was in Brooklyn on its first, uh, its first line. Uh, wonderful cartoon, there was apparently a strike because the, uh, the guys that were running the trolleys felt they weren't getting enough money. So now they, they went off strike, and now you see the, the people bouncing off the trolleys. Okay, but it turned out that it wasn't until May of 1895 that um, uh, what wound up happening at the beginning of the season was the Brooklyn team played the Philadelphia team, and they were rained out like three or four games in a row. So the local guy in the press for, for Brooklyn says, uh, oh, we gotta play the Rainmakers again. So that offended the people in Philadelphia. So uh, you'll see the quote up there in Scranton, from Scranton, Pennsylvania, that he says, well, they want to play Rainmakers, they end up with a bunch of trolley dodgers. Okay, so that's the first time we ever have that ever really used historically. Now, here's what Easton Park looks like today. Very impressive, huh? Let me tell you, you drive there and get out of the car, you can't wait till you leave. You don't feel safe. Okay, there's just something in the air there. Okay, um, and if you look, I believe I've got, yes. What, what um, uh, was predicted by Charles Byrne was that they would go and create roads right through the middle of the field and turn it into four lots. Guess what happened after they left? They, they took Junius Street and Belmont Street, ran them right through, and that's what we have. If you go there today, uh, you'll see, well, like I saw with the pictures, uh, the, the, uh, um, that's the Long Island Railroad on the top there at Van Sinderen. Uh, uh, if you go down another two blocks, that's where the, the, the tire place is. And if you look through the fence, uh, which is the picture on the far right, you can see the train. Okay, very depressing, very smelly, and you would never imagine that, you know, for six years a professional baseball team happened there. Okay, so now, Charles Burns started coming into his own. Uh, Bell got rid of his gambling casino in uh, uh, Newport, uh, which was called the Nautilus Club, or the Clubhouse, in 1895. He got rid of his gambling casino in 1890, and now he wanted out because now we're going to start having a war with the American League. Okay? These guys were sick of wars with leagues, and it cost them money. Because now you got another team on your turf competing for the same dollars. One of the tricks they played, and I love this one, if the other team was holding a double header, you would hold a triple header. So the people would come and see your game. Um, so he decided, uh, he found the land diagonally across the street from the first Washington Park, uh, which you, 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 can, you can see the second Washington Park here. Um, and it was rented from the Litchfield Corporation, who, um, he was a robber baron associated with Cornelius Vanderbilt, and he was building from this land where they built the park, uh, a railroad that connected the ferries at Montague Street and Fulton Street. Okay, so they rented the land from him and they built Washington Park too. And by then, by 18, 98, Abel was pretty much done. He still owned stock until 1907, but apparently he only communicated with them by mail from his place in Cape Cod. Um, he lived in East Yarmouth, which is right near Hyannisport, where the Kennedy compound is. And uh, when he was done with the gambling and done with the uh, casino, uh, he moved there for the rest of his life. And he, at age 80 in 1913, died of Bright's disease, the same thing that his buddy Charlie Byrne died of. Uh, Lord knows the diets these guys had. Okay, so now we have, um, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, 
uh, the team was forced to combine with the Baltimore Orioles. Now let's not be confused with the Baltimore Orioles that exist today because they, that team actually uh, came from St. Louis as the Browns and they took the name Baltimore Orioles. Also too, when Vernon and Bell were buying things, they bought up a team called the Metropolitans. Okay, they played in New York. And that's where the New York Mets got their name from historically, from them. Uh, so here we have Harry Von der Horst and Ned Hanlon who were forced upon uh, uh, because of all the money that they lost, they brought in new partners and new blood, and now the team was partially owned by these guys. Um, Harry Von der Horst is on the left, three pictures, and Ned Hamlin's on the right. You may recall that the team was called for a while uh, uh, the Brooklyn Superbas. Okay, there was a vaudevillian troupe that went around the United States called Hanlon's Superbas. Okay, and uh, you know, something you go see a a variety show that was held in some sort of a hall. Uh, so they decided to take Hanlon's name Superbus and apply it to the team. So that's when we got the name Superbus being applied. Now here we have the opening of Washington Park 2. And what you'll see here is uh, a woodcut from uh, the Brooklyn Eagle from the day that it opened. And then the next shot is a year later. And I want to point out to you, in the middle to the left, do you notice that there's uh, something that looks like canvas up there? Can you see it? Let's see how that Right here? All right. You know Chicago Cubs? So people sitting in the outfield watching the games for free? Guess what? Same thing. Okay, if you look closely, you'll see people sitting on the fire escapes and on the top of the building. And what's really funny is there were bars down there. And what was hoisted up to the people watching the game for free was growlers of beer. They were called growlers. Growlers of beer. So they could sit there and get drunk while they watched the game for free. Okay, also this building historically, it was called the Guinea Flats. That's an uncomplimentary name for Italians, Guineas. Okay, but that's what was used back then, and, and they were pejoratively called the Guinea Flats. I can remember when I was a kid growing up, we take the Long Island Expressway out, and one of the exits was called Guinea Woods Road. Okay, and, and during the, you know, the time that we had Prohibition, this is where the houses were on, in Guinea Woods along that road. So, uh, well, that term might not be uh, uh, politically correct today, it, it, it was part of the, the parlance at that time. Okay, so here's a picture of the outside of Washington Park. I've also included some programs from my collection in there uh, and various views. Also, the, if you see the blue thing on the bottom, that's a pass signed by Ferdinand de Bell that would get you into the park free. Maybe if you bet enough money, he'd give you a free pass to the ball, uh, to the baseball game. Okay, some more interior shots of uh, Washington Park too. Uh, you can see it was in a gritty neighborhood. I think uh, Doris Goodwin Kearns called them gritty, charming men with, with uh, uh, falling apart wooden ballparks or something to that, because all these parks were, were made out of wood. In fact, this park, while the team was out on the road in 1898, uh, I'm forgetting the date now, the park burned down because somebody rented out the park and they lit a cigarette and burned down the grandstands. They were on a trip for two weeks. When they came back, guess what? The park was rebuilt. I'd like to see you do that today. Rebuild the park in two weeks. <clears throat> okay, now I'm, I'm gonna just take you for a while now back to me. That's my great, great, great grandfather. When I did the, the history of my family using Ancestry.com, I found a relative that found a picture of Ferdinand Sherry, who was my grandfather's grandfather. <laughs> Okay, and um, Ferdinand was a, a little shoemaker. I found it in the directory. He lived near Union Square, right near uh, uh, Bell's 1818 Broadway, right where Gangs of New York happened, just north of that. Uh, Napoleon wanted him to join the German army, uh, the French army fight the Germans. Otto von Bismarck wanted him to join the French army and fight the Germans. So both sides wanted him to, to fight the other side. He says to them, the hell with you, I'm a shoemaker, I'm going 
going to New York. I don't want to fight anyone. Okay. Uh, the irony of all that is in World War II, my father went back to the same place and fought the Germans. So. <laughs> okay, so you can't save your genes forever. Um, he's buried in Calvary, where Charles uh, Byrne is also buried. And, uh, you know, unlike the characters that I brought to you tonight, uh, the only thing I can find about him is that he died of a brain aneurysm, that he was a shoemaker, and the address where he lived. He didn't do anything as, uh, I don't know, world-shaking as these other guys. But in the long run, they all wound up in the same place, didn't they? <laughs> and here, we see in January of 1913, they're carting away Washington Park, tearing away. And let's see, what does the uh, caption read? Washington Park baseball field uh, fades into history, as does my presentation to you tonight. Thank you. Yes. 